How's everyone doing? Excellent. Um, just a quick show of hands while we're getting every slides up and everything. How many people have used Azure or heard of Azure? Quite a few. Excellent. How many people know about serverless? <laughs> All right, good. There's a few fewer people in the room, so that's a good thing. Um, so yeah, I, I, am, I have this crazy obsession with um, Alice in Wonderland, so I try and name everything Alice in Wonderland. I was really hoping to come up on stage today and be like the Mad Hatter, um, but things didn't work out with my costume, so I apologize. Um, I've been working at Microsoft for five years now. Uh, I've been fo focusing the whole time on the PaaS platform, and then when we evolved into serverless, uh, I started doing that as well. Um, so for the people that aren't quite aware of what serverless is, um, don't, send, don't hit the send button on your text messages or your, or your emails to your boss and say, get rid of all of our servers now, there's this new amazing thing out. Um, it's not that, it's not that. Um, so serverless is just an abstraction away from servers. So you still have physical hardware underneath. The benefit is uh, though that you literally don't have to worry about them. All you're doing is deploying little bits of code. These code, little bits of code are executed based on some sort of event that comes into a system. And the really big benefit to it is it's really cheap because we just charge you for each execution. So you can keep costs really low um, because you're not running these servers 24 by 7. Yep. At the risk of going down a rabbit hole, um, how do you distinguish uh, PaaS from um, So I look, at, I look at serverless as an evolution of PaaS, right? The, the whole idea of PaaS was, Let's try and avoid, like, let's abstract things away and let's do patching and things like that on your behalf. Um, from a past platform perspective, you don't worry about the underlying operating system. In serverless, you don't worry about the underlying hardware, operating system, anything. You really just focus on that little piece of code um, that you're focused on. And I'm going to get into demos really quickly, like Steve did, um, because I see the benefit to that as well. Uh, and then going all the way back to the first speaker, I believe his name is Matt. Um, it's interesting because he brought up all of these little components, and that's actually one of the big pieces of uh, why serverless is great, um, because you can actually build a lot of great systems around it. You can focus on DevOps, uh, because all you're worrying about is shipping little bits of code. It becomes really easy to get that pipeline up and running. Uh, because you're only focusing on business logic, your ability to go and produce something uh, goes out really quickly. In fact, in the next two minutes, I'm going to go through a couple demos or a demo that's going to build a full Twitter dashboard. Uh, so if you do have Twitter on your devices, you want to get that handy um, so you can help me out with my demo so I don't have to do it on stage. Uh, that'd be great. So what is Microsoft Service Platform? Um, really quick pitch. Uh, basically, we have two main pieces, which is functions, which is the serverless runtime, uh, custom code, we build uh, integrations into our own platform in the form of binding and triggers. So the triggers are the things that respond to those events that are coming in, and the bindings give you the ability to abstract away our other features. Uh, so all you have to do is write a few lines of code instead of figuring out a full SDK uh, to actually go and deliver on something. And then Logic Apps, which is kind of a full orchestration slash workflow, uh, workflow platform, um, that allows you to kind of go and build very complex systems in a very simple uh, visual way. And then that connects into a whole bunch of stuff. So in my demo, I have um, a cognitive services thing that goes and does some text analytics. Uh, we have things that connect into Twitter, uh, Outlook, or any kind of email provider. And then some of the differentiators as well is we actually support IDE. So if I get the chance to, which I might be able to, uh, I can show you that you can actually go and develop your functions locally on your machine. Uh, right now, it only works for Windows, sorry. Um, but we're working really quickly on getting it up and running on Mac and Linux as well. Uh, so you'd be able to go and do cross-platform development uh, locally for all your functions. Here's some key things. Um, I'm not going to read these for you, because I hate when people do that. I'm going to tell you a few things in addition to this, uh, which is the some of the good patterns around serverless is um, really good software patterns. So exit quickly. So if you have something where you can determine, I don't need to run this anymore, do so as quick as possible. Because remember, when you're going and you're executing code, it's charging you money. And if you don't have to spend that much money at the end of the year, your boss has more money to spend on you for bonuses, which is a huge benefit. 
Um, some of the integrations that we have on our platform, uh, lots of different server uh, connectivity through messaging. Um, both Logic App and Functions allow you to do message-based things. It's actually the quickest way to scale uh, server a serverless platform. And then this next one's really small, but the only thing I want to get you in the idea of is this is the visual designer. So we have lots of different integration points into this Logic App workflow uh, where we can connect it to different services and literally they just show up as little boxes on the screen. So now we're in demo land. Let's go out here to our cloud. Um, so here we have the, the dashboard. Uh, this is the easiest way to get going in Azure. Uh, we do have a command line interface as well. Um, so if you want to go check that out, it's all written in Python. Um, you can go and do that. But um, for simplicity's sake, because I do have that visual designer in my demo, I'm going to stick to the portal for now. So once again, don't want to do typos. So I filled out all this information. Uh, but this is going and creating our first serverless container, quote unquote container. We'll get back to that in a second, not to confuse it with containers that Steve talked about. Um, but the idea here is we've, we thought of the DevOps workflow, um, DevOps workflow, and you have to ship code in all of these pieces. So what we do is we create this thing called a function app, and then the function app becomes kind of the kicking off point for where all your little functions sit. Uh, it actually acts as a scale boundary as well, so it makes it easy. All your functions scale up at once, uh, so they're ready to, ready to roll when everything's going. This next part is the logic app. I'm just kicking these off, getting them going, um, but I wanted to show you how simple it is to go and create these. So you just fill out a few details and hit create. So those should be kicking off. I'm just going to go into what's called a resource group, which is a full container of its own logical grouping of services within um, my application. So if I pop into my function for the very first time, you can kind of, you'll be able to see that we have this whole can, um, kind of grouping of things that you can do. We have functions, we have proxies, which provide easy ways to route uh, different APIs across all of your functions, so for microservices. Um, so we're going to go in here and create our first function. Pretty simple. We can go and say API and webhook. I'm just going to go to create custom. And this will load up a library of all of the different uh, things we have. We have support for many different languages. Um, but I'm a fan of JavaScript, so I'm going to go and use that. And then once again with the typing, I'm going to cheat. There we go. So all I have to do is go and provide that. The template's going to go fill out my function for me, and I'll have some bootstrap ready to go code uh, that's sitting in my function. Right here, it's just going to do a really simple hello world where it grabs your name off the query string. I'm just going to replace that. I'll walk through this code in a second. There we go. So basically, what I'm going to be doing is once I kick into the Logic app, uh, we're going to be talking to uh, a text analytics service. So Right here, all I'm doing is taking a tweet, categorizing it to either be uh, green, which is positive sentiment, yellow, which is kind of iffy, or red, which is very negative sentiment, um, based on the score that comes back from that. So I can go and save my function here. To be able to test it out, I'm just going to go to test. And I can fill in, say, a negative sentiment, which is point, oh, or 0 0.2, hit run. And really quickly, I get my response back, which says this would be red if it was actually to run. So let's go put that into the context of our, our logic app. So I'm just going to pull up the logic app designer. Um, this is a very simple way to kind of go and orchestrate everything. Uh, what we're going to be adding to this is a Twitter trigger, which is going to, this is the part that you're going to come in. So if I go down here and I say, let's use a blank logic app. And we'll start preloading Twitter. Does someone want to think of a hashtag that we're going to react to? Hashtag Azure Functions. But then I'm going to have something negative uh, against Azure Functions. So I'm not going to do that. That'd be an anti-pattern of presenting. So I'm going to say uh, devnet create az, right? Because that keeps it kind of negative and out of the or we can keep that negative space away from the conference as well, because that would be bad. Um, so let's go and use this. 
I already went and authenticated against Twitter. We just do a simple OAuth dance for you. Um, the next thing is we're going to go and bring that into our Cognitive Services API. So I'm just going to say uh, text analytics. There we go. Uh, detect sentiment. And I'm just going to go and copy some things from here. So this is just a connection name and an authentication key. There we go. Hit create. So that's going to go and talk to our great APIs in the background. Um, what do I need? I need to get the tweet text to be able to get the sentiment. And uh, we're off to the next step. So our next step here is to call into our function, because uh, we need to understand what is that sentiment. So let's go and say, grab the function. Um, we need an action. Let's choose our function. And I created a devnet function. And then we have our categorized sentiment function here. So what are we going to send into this? Well, that's simple. Let's send in our score from our analytics. So it's going to go out and say, hey, this was pretty negative. Um, we'll give it a certain rating. We'll pass that rating along to our function. Our function will know what to do with it. And then I'm going to do one last thing, um, which everyone needs a, a little dashboard to send to their manager. So um, when I can go home, I can tell you, you know, these tweets were during my demo, but the rest of the tweets around this were awesome, and I did a great job presenting. Please send some of those. Um, so basically, we just go here, whoops, add our Power BI dashboard, and then this is going to be very quick. I've already created kind of a custom uh, data set in the back end. Let's go to my workspace. I have a DevNet create data set and just a tweet table here. So all we need to do is pull in those things from Twitter. So I have tweet text tweeted by. What was that? Nope. Score our category that should come back from our function body. Created at from Twitter, which might need to search for. There we go. So you're starting to get the idea that you know we have a nice visual designer makes things super easy. You don't have to think about coding too much. And then the next step, just so uh, I can collect all of these things in an email, we'll just go and create a condition. So whenever the body from this oops, is equal to red, let's go and do something. So we'll add one last action, which is to say email it to me at my outlook.com address. I know there's so many things. But the best thing is we're going to have a really awesome demo at the end of this. So we'll just say send an email. That will load up a very quick template. Apparently, I missed signing in for this. And maybe the demo gods will be kind. Cool. This is why I like to sign in for things ahead of time. Uh, no. Six minutes. All right, we will get this signed in. Nothing to worry about. Have me worry there for a second. All right, there we go. So our two email address, let's just go and send it to myself. There we go. Subject, negative tweet from. And this is cool, because you can actually mix in results that are coming in as well. So I can say the Twitter username as part of the subject. And then I'll just take the tweet text, 
which is the body. And I can go and hit save on this and we'll be ready to go. All right, that was a lot of setup. Did I lose anyone? One person. Good point. All right, so let's go and review really quickly. So basically what I've done here is, oops, collapse, there we go. This uh, function that is going out is an HTTP function. So HTTP has a request and it has a response. So the response we're just sending simply in the body, which uh, is this right here. So I just, when I formulate the, res the response object in my function, I'm just setting the body to the category, and that's what I went and programmed. Thank you for clarifying. Um, so basically, now we have that. Let's go over here and take a quick look, which I said every three minutes. All right. So if anything, we will get at least my tweet out. Um, but once we go through this, flow, this full flow, uh, we'll, we'll be able to get things in. I think I went and set it as three minutes. Um, so if we need to, we can just bump it down to a couple seconds. Um, but one last thing I'm going to go and set up, because we went and set up this Power BI workflow. So if we start getting these tweets in, at least this will light up. Um, so I'm going to add in a title, or sorry, a uh, tile from our data stream. There we go. We'll just uh, create a simple line chart based on our score. There we go. All right, so all that's pulled together. Do we have any emails yet? Negative, but we can at least check to see if our Logic app has run. All right, so what this is doing is it's kicking off the full workflow. It goes out to Twitter, detects the sentiment, or, s or sends the tweet that we received back from Twitter off to the API. We go and categorize it in our function which we can go see if our function started and it completed. So we actually had a successful run at the bottom here. Exciting. Then we kick in and we send it into our Power BI data set and then create a condition that goes out and sends an email. And here we go, we have a couple of emails coming through and still two minutes on the clock. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> All right. And then this Power BI dashboard will go and start visualizing this so I can start to see you know, how many negative tweets I'm getting over time. Now with the remaining two minutes, let's go and talk about some CLI because I was looking while uh, Steve was presenting and he actually went out and uh, used his, his command line. So I'm gonna do the same. And I apologize if my, uh, this one thing I did not look at, but I think it should be good. You know it's a legit CLI because it has some ASCII art. Um, so what we need to do to get started is I've already run function init, and that just goes and initializes kind of a host area. Uh, that sets up everything your function needs. So there's a settings uh, area, a host.json file, where you can go and configure other stuff. Um, then all you need to do is say uh, func new, and then we actually go out, and the same templates that are available online, we have a yeoman generator running locally. So you can go out and say, I want my HTTP trigger. We give it the same default name that it would have uh, before, but I'm just going to go and change this to HTTP trigger one. And then you can see here I, I had a backup. So the HTTP one is the one we're going to look at. And then the last thing I can do, because it's, it's already going to go, it had that hello world provide your name. Let's just say func run. Oops, uh, I need to provide the HTTP trigger one. There we go. So what this is going to do is it's going to boot up a very small web server on my local machine. It's going to start everything. You can see I got a bad request because it doesn't automatically add the query string value for you. But if we go over to our 
API endpoint here and say HTTP trigger one. Do, do, do. Did it load up on a different port? Localhost 7071. API HTTP trigger. HTTP trigger one. Ah. No, this isn't good. So if we pop back in here, let's just uh, close down this instance and try again. Okay, so we're funk running. It's going to go and boot up that web server. Everything's good to go. Oh, there we go. It did change to... Nope, it should just be there. Copy. I just closed that down, didn't I? This is why live demos are fun. All right. There we go. Web server's up and running. URL not going to work out for me. All right, and I'm over time. Unfortunately, so what would have happened there is uh, we would have had it, the web server up and running. We could have gone and connected directly to our function, and we would have had a local debug experience. Um, but maybe if you want to catch me uh, somewhere in and around here, because I will be sticking around, come find me, and I can show you when I get it working. Thank you so much. <laughs>